Hello and welcome to a new episode of Las Platicas. Kristen, who is on our Zoom interview Las Platicas event today? You always scare me when you're when you do the intro. <laughs> All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's, hello, and I, I jump every time. <laughs> yes, so like Sarah said, welcome to another episode of Las Platicas, a show hosted by the Commodity Comics podcast, where we meet with creators and friends to talk about upcoming projects, events, and all around awesome news in the Latinx comic community. Today, we have the pleasure of having Brina Nunez with us. Yay! Yay! I, want, I miss our little, our little I, I, yeah. sound effects. <laughs> our jazz little. hands, jazz hands. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, Brina is an Afro-Guatemalan Salvadoran cartoonist and educator whose self-published works are personal autobiographical comics that include everything from personal diary entries to politics and even history lessons. Her work has appeared in the New Yorker Daily Shouts and The Nib. She's had her work in anthologies like Tales from La Vida, a Latinx comics anthology, Drawing Power, which was Eisner Award winner in 2020, and Be Gay Do Comics, an Ignaz <laughs> Award winner also in 2020. She's been a professor at California College of the Arts and is also the co-founder of La Neja House, a Bay Area-based small press that solely publishes the work of Lawrence Lindell and Breen's Nunez, Breen's Brina, <laughs> Brina <laughs> Nunez, <laughs> and the Baileys. La Neja House is built on the foundation of family love of comics, zines, and coffee. That sounds so amazing. Uh, projects include comics, graphic novels, art books, zines, and limited edition box sets. Their first project was released in January 2021, and don't think we're not going to ask about that. So <laughs> all of that to say, welcome, Brina. Thank you so much for being here. Yay. <laughs> me it's such a huge privilege like I'm just so happy that this podcast exists and I just love hearing all of your conversations my favorite part <laughs> is, like your opinions about what y'all are drinking too because <laughs> that's important. well is. thank you thank you, you know so what much. I love your little doodle of yourself is so such an amazing depiction <laughs> of you in real life. <laughs> like I'm looking at you right now on the screen and I just in my mind I, I just have replaced what you look like now with your little caricature. <laughs> but it is so realistic and it's very simplistic. It's very, you know, minimalist, but it looks exactly like you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> that means so much to hear for that from y'all. Oh my God. I love it. I love it so much. I am my own mascot. <laughs> you know what? I one of your comics that, that was so cute. You had where you had it on, and it, I was looking at it and I was like, oh my God, this is so cute. But that's I can picture her like that in real life with your mask. So I think it's your chonga, your chongo. <laughs> your chongo is the same in real life as it is in your <laughs> i i think it's i'm pretty things. sure chonga is something else yeah sorry your chongo <laughs> i think it's a combination of el chongo lo, the glasses and her dangly earrings i uh, love those the, mm -hmm. oh, I, I love when you draw those on your character i'm like oh look at that the bling i love it <laughs> Yeah, they haven't been wearing a lot of it lately just because, I don't know, I haven't been decorating myself enough during the panini. panini. <laughs> the panini. The panini. <laughs> oh my God, I feel that. Like, uh, right now, is the, today is the first day I have worn a full face of makeup because I bought a bunch yesterday because I was like, I'm like, I want to like put makeup back on my face and stuff like that. And I was like, I'm going to be going out doing some stuff as well. So I might as well just put on a full face of makeup. And I was just like, as I was putting it on, I was just like, wow, I forgot that I used to like meditate. 
<laughs> or like fall into like a meditative state as I was putting on my makeup and I was just like this is nice and to think when I was first putting on makeup I was just like oh my god this is gonna come out as a disaster now I'm just like boom boom oh uh, you picked <laughs> it up so quickly it looks amazing <laughs> well <laughs> thank you Brina we'd love to hear all about how you created your your little uh character and how all that came to about so what we like for our guests to do is to share their origin story of how they entered into the comics industry. So can you please introduce yourself to our listeners um, by talking a little bit about how you began your comics career? Yeah, I'd love to um, go all the way back, way before when, <laughs> before times, around like 2013. That's when I had more like I was developing more confidence to um, enter myself into zine fests um, like our local one over here San Francisco zine fest and self-publishing mini comics um, but mostly like zines that were just portraits and illustrations of all of these different women from different parts of Central America modeled by people who I really admire who were scholars um, or a family friend, somebody on the internet who's doing <laughs> cool work. Um, and um, yeah, and then I, eventually I was reached out to by a um, wonderful friend um, who works at Akonari Foundation in Oakland. Uh, her name was Vanessa and she asked if I wanted to curate like a comic show and I was just like still wow. new and like a baby to comics <laughs> in general like how the industry like works um yeah and I was just asking her do you really want me to because I've never done any kind of curation like whatsoever mm -hmm. but somehow I just wanted to um create a space and get the guidance from her to include like friends, just community from like different parts of the Bay Area. Like it was called mm -hmm. How Women uh, Women in Comics and Illustration. And oh my God, it was like such a blast. And we had friends like from different genres. And mm -hmm. I feel like maybe that kind of led me to getting that invitation from Fred Aldama to um, also participate in that uh, Tales from La Vida anthology and yeah I was in Oakland at the time and it was like my first time also living away from home from my parents like in the peninsula and um, which is like south of San Francisco um, we moved around a lot so like seeing what's my hometown maybe besides south San Francisco mm -hmm. it's kind of like a hard thing for me to answer too but um, yeah being in Oakland like allowed me to like have a lot of space and time just to think about how to answer this question he posed to um, some of us in the anthology. Like what, when was there like a moment in your life where you felt really proud of being Latinx? And I immediately thought of um, this one time I was a part of a student run clinic called Clinica Martin Baro which is run by San Francisco State students and UCSF medical students. And we had Olympia and that was one of like the very first, well, I don't wanna say very first lessons on how to receive care or like the whole movement of like self care. But um, through that whole experience, I just had like these really vivid visions of being in, in Guatemala specifically like Atitlan where we would always go to whenever we visit Guatemala um, on my mom's side of the family. And yeah, ever since I was able to like manage to squish all of that into two pages, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, like, I hope I keep being able to like do more stuff like this. And I don't know, after that, I use that as like my submission to also get into grad school at California College of the Arts for their MFA in comics program. Um, mm -hmm. I was really attracted to it because I was also teaching comics um, to youth in San Francisco while I was trying to learn how to make comics too. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of entered into the whole thing by being a comics educator for kids. 
That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I really love, I've only been to one zine fest here in LA, um, but I, the experience was so awesome and I love the community, just like the comics community, but the zine fest community that was there and just, uh, there were some people that were in their booths just like selling random stuff, the creations that they created, but just really random. <laughs> then I just, I bought some stuff that had like this is gonna be funny that had <laughs> like naked pictures of men but then this person had like clipped out like heads of like stuffed animals and put them on it and it just spoke to me and I bought it <laughs> <laughs> oh Kristen that's so you <laughs> Oh, wow. but I mean, that's what I say when I'm like the community that I felt and just like that, the, what I was in, introduced to there. And then, you know, there was people with um, their prose books. There were people with their zines. There were people with comics. There was so much there. And it was just open to everybody and everyone just so creative. It was so awesome. So I love that that is part of your origin story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. There's just something beautiful about zine culture that I don't know it's it's all about liberation at the end of the day like mm-hmm. no one's telling you to not make a zine about naked men with like superimposed stuffed animals yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be literally about pizza cats and <laughs> I'm trying to think I was just like oh wow like I wouldn't imagine myself getting this but it's in my library right now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just see it as pure liberation, like as far as you get to be the person in charge of like everything, editing, you're the illustrator, you're like the prose writer, you're doing it all. Did you always uh, know that you wanted to self-publish rather than like seek out like somebody that might, you know, publish your book? Was that always the always the thought process? Yeah, I think for a good majority of the time I was um, getting into zine culture and touring with my with my husband I imagine myself continuing to self-publish for like forever and like that kind of still stands with (laughs) with me today but um yeah I think it's just been more recently where I feel like oh wow like the idea of somebody like reaching out who wants to actually like make a graphic novel or like publish um a graphic novel sounds cool. I don't know. There's also like something beautiful I love about collecting like graphic novels and comics and like volumes. I just love holding the object and carrying that with me. It's also, I don't know, it's like a comfort, comforting thing, kind of like a security blanket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. Definitely. You know, we'd love to hear more about uh, Laniha. Laneha. Laneha. You know, I said it right before and then I just I sucked, I sucked myself out, guys. <laughs> We'd love to hear more about Laneha House, uh, that small publishing company that you started with your husband. Uh, walk us through that, uh, that, how that idea originated and please do share uh, the project that you guys released in January of this year. Yeah, the conversation has kind of been like, ongoing like for most of 2019 and um, just the idea of self-publishing work and doing it um, on our own means and like on our own time we've had like both of us had opportunities to get our works published like mostly comic strips like in places like the New Yorker which has been a really amazing experience to do but I don't know there's just something even more gratifying about owning like a press and giving yourself like the time and the again the feeling of agency and liberation to create any kind of content that might not be deemed as like popular or like even marketable like in comic industry standards but yeah it's all about centering like that love that we had with zine culture and we met each other through a zine fest as well oh <laughs> <Aww. laughs> alternative book um 
zine fest like ebabs yeah and we kept running into each other through zine fests like different ones in the bay area there's <laughs> my side. i hope they're okay but <laughs> Sorry, i got so <laughs> i 100 percent thought that was coming from jen's house <laughs> I thought you it know was what, coming fair. from my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we have uh, Los Angeles County uh, <laughs> versus uh, Bay Area. It could be coming from anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, All in the same state, though. All of yeah. them. <laughs> that is it's up and down. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, so you had that um, project in January. What was the what was your first project that the uh, that, that not Laneha House published? You're referring to the Baileys, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'll give this like a lot of credit to my my husband because he was the one and he, pretty much like the sole like curator organizer behind the whole project. Um, yeah, I feel like it's just been a really beautiful experience just for me to witness like him organizing everything um creating a space like a physical like tangible space like in the form of a magazine to archive other bay area cartoonists of color who are also like non-bipoc as well who are queer people who have been a part of like the comics culture that he felt that really needed to be represented and just like heard and I don't know just honored through like a magazine like the Baileys and it includes like so many people that we love like just chosen comic family like Justin Hall, uh, Tana Tucker and these are like people we've come to really admire and have been doing so much work and just beautiful like storytelling and whenever I think about Bay Area culture I think about these people that are in like the first issue and just seeing like the process like in our other like (laughs) in our other room um, seeing and print everything and it just looks so lush and beautiful (laughs) with different stories and um, to me being somebody who was born and raised here like I feel like it's just been such a beautiful representation of how like culturally eclectic we are as a community like I finally get to see a collection of comics with people who are you know who just don't look like me they happen to be like Asian American like Panay or like Southeast Asian and somebody who's trans as well there's just so many voices and I'm so happy that it's finally coming together and he's been doing such a beautiful job with it that's awesome. That's awesome. It yeah. is. It sounds like an amazing work. We love your work. Oh my god! I, I just <laughs> I learned so much from your comics. Like, um, I mean, I'm fanning out, guys. I can't help it. <laughs> um, I'm f- I'm fangirling out here. Um, I really love that that strip where you talk about like how different uh, peoples had uh, had kind of a community of people that didn't have kind of a didn't define their sex or 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 sexual identity I thought that was amazing I'm like oh my god that existed really oh my god that's so wonderful um I love how you dove into like the history of of um how they what what was it uh not Guatemala El Salvador that doesn't um doesn't accept or even talk about um people of color within their community or, or the country, you know, and even though all the countries around them do. And I, I just, I want to thank you for doing all that research and teaching me a few things. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, girls. <laughs> I kind of took over. I just I really wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I really like your work about that too, because uh, I believe I first saw your work at the Latin Comics Expo and uh what drew me was the fact that you had the comic half and half out i believe and it said uh like a zine i believe it said like a zine about being half salvadorian half guatemalan and it drew me because my parents are from guatemala and i was just like oh my god like i never i rarely see anything 
about Guatemala and like being like raised Guatemalan and stuff like that. And so I, I really like how you, t- your works tend to reflect very personal aspects about yourself and they're very autobiographical. So I kind of wanted to know about what is your creative process in, in taking these topics that are close and personal to you and offering them up to readers in a way that is accessible. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I love that question. <laughs> I definitely just think about what are some things that are like rattling in my head and that just need to like manifest itself on paper. (laughs) (laughs) For most of my my youth, um, I've I've been very like quiet. I was always known as being like the quiet kid, like ever since middle school. And um, there's just so many thoughts that little me had growing up and wondering like who am I like already had a (laughs) special crisis already (laughs) like what does it mean for me to like exist as like a Central Mm -hmm. American and as somebody who comes from like a very mixed background too like being Mm -hmm. like raised by a Guatemalan mother and seeing my Salvadoran dad like every other weekend in East Palo Alto but Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also coming from a place where I I just wanted to create something for her and wondering like, what would she enjoy reading? What would other people who are also like mixed, who are like Salvadorian, Guatemalan, or just there, there's also like a community of mixed Central Americans too that I come to know from touring and mm-hmm. have so much to talk about. And <laughs> just like, and we need like a conference for this kind of situation. <laughs> but yeah just um how my process looks like nowadays it's mostly like making lists and I I want to credit um some folks I really admire friend um Alan Pelayas Lopez um and um I attended one of their workshops and I just really admired their process there was a prompt that they gave the attendees um just like creating a list I forgot like what the the subject or what the main topic was about but that just really helped me organize my thoughts um and whatever just visually like feels intriguing from like that list I'll try to like make like a really rough like thumbnail of the comic like or the comic strip and yeah my, my process has kind of been messy I won't lie <laughs> it used to be that I would just um, pencil like my thoughts right away like without any editing and then ink and then try to like squish all of like the words <laughs> the speech balloons and I'm like oh damn like this is not <laughs> somebody needs a magnifying glass to read this, <laughs> this <speech laughs> you had a lot to say <laughs> <laughs> definitely especially with that comic in Tales from La Vida like I always kind of laugh at <laughs> how much text there is and how tiny it is because I'm like, I can't even do this anymore. <laughs> Sometimes you just got a lot of say. <laughs> yes. That's funny. So you're mentioning your process about sketching and drawing and stuff. Um, how young were you when you actually found uh, like solace in drawing? Yeah, that's a great question very young I want to say maybe when I was like a toddler um, oh wow yeah mm-hmm. I, I honestly needed to use uh drawing to communicate like what I was feeling because mm-hmm. I was such a quiet kid mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I'm feeling more like open to say this too I was um misdiagnosed with um autism I believe and it was because um my family didn't know why I wasn't speaking like Spanish mm-hmm. or English um, mm-hmm. so I, they took me to a doctor they were wondering like oh my god like is she deaf like can't she like not process anything and um, he just said that oh <laughs> this is probably why um, you're also speaking multiple languages and that's not great for her <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for like her little like developing brain so just speak to her only in English so that was prescribed to my family so Wow. You're not the only one, though. Like, for me, I had trouble with, uh, I guess, spelling. 
but that's still my problem. So one of the things that the, the teachers would tell my parents was like, oh, you know, it's she's learning English in school, but you talk to her in Spanish. That's confusing her. And it and actually studies show now that it actually makes us more critical thinkers. Yes. And it makes us mm -hmm. more intelligent. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's actually, I believe like a lot of early development uh or childhood development book, books now say that a child uh um uh, that is like like three to four years old can easily pick up around three to four languages mm -hmm. uh, when they're learning yeah. yeah so it's just like it's not about confusion it's just it just goes to show just how information and knowledge changes and stuff yeah. like that yeah but oh my god Sorry, I am being distracted by a cat who demand is demanding my attention. <laughs> <laughs> but I always wonder that with uh, with creators that we talk to who um, are uh, artists, um, how early they knew that that was like their calling, or at least they had a, a, a great affinity for it. Because I never did. I wish I did. Um, now stick figures are even too complicated <laughs> for me but um when I watch people create in that way it just completely blows my mind because mm -hmm. I can't do it <laughs> and I believe all of them have responded with about the same age that yeah. you do Rena. they they all say like yeah no like I was like a toddler like I was a kid or like I was like I was like super young and I was just all like okay cool <laughs> I want someone to come on and be like I was 40 years old <laughs> and you can do it too <laughs> so um in uh, our introduction, we mentioned that you're presently taking a break from teaching to work on your graphic memoir, Morena. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you hope to convey uh, to your readers in this comic? And then what we really, really want to know is when you're doing a memoir, how do you choose? I mean, that's so totally close and personal and up in your business. How do you choose what to include and what not to include because I feel like I would probably go completely the the spectrum of TMI <laughs> <laughs> go off the rails yeah <laughs> it's all up to you um yeah so I'm taking a break this semester um to focus on re-outlining my memoir um just because I realized there were actually like a lot of things that were missing when I was mm. trying to create like a manuscript thingamajiggy um, in grad school. And it was originally just going to be about the first time I went to El Salvador as like a super socially awkward 16 year old and who had like very like little to no handle on Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> but then I realized like, oh my God, there's also something I need to like have, be in conversation with it's about also like being like Guatemalan as well or like somebody who was like raised in this type of way something that I feel like I was giving a lot of attention to because there's a lot of like things that I wanted to like include that I don't know I guess what I'm trying to say is I was sort of like literally splitting my identity into two. I thought that, okay, when uh, volume of like this memoir is just going to be dedicated to being Salvadoran and then the next one will be about being Guatemalan or mm -hmm. Guatemalan American. And it just didn't feel right to me to just separate the two because I don't know, I just can't. I sometimes feel like I can't even do that, like split my identity into like multiple. How do you split something that is so intertwined into who you are? Yeah. So that it's, it feels if I, I know what you mean, like it feels messy to be like, I, I'm not just, I'm not just one and the other, like separately at times. And I don't know, I like, I feel Salvadorian this day, or I feel Guatemalan. You are both of them. And on top of that, you're also American. So it's just like, how does every, how does this all tie? You can't just cleanly separate everything because it's so, it's so messily you. So mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm, I perfectly understand. 
Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much like why I also wanted to include both sides and all sides of identity as much as I can. Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm like home is also here in California, like I was born and raised here. And there's, you know, stories like that, that I never really get to hear about, like growing up, like mm -hmm. first gen stories, especially of being a part of like these communities and also having, you know, knowing where your roots are back in Central America. I think also to answer the question about how I pick and choose, I think it just depends on like um, how I want to answer certain questions to my younger self, especially the ones that mm. like circle around, like, you know, what does it mean to like exist as a Guatemalan person, what does it mean to be Salvadoran? What are people, how are people defining Guatemalanness and Salvadoranness in the United States? And oftentimes mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not very good representation, <laughs> very like, yeah. very sad, very just like bogged down um, narratives of just coming from countries that are like poor, impoverished. Um, very violent and just people who are like desperate to come to this country to like seek better opportunities mm -hmm. and oftentimes people don't include like also like the ways the united states has influenced like the politics and like the reasons why people are migrating to the u.s like mm -hmm. there's just so much that little me didn't know about like that she didn't know about what it just means to exist and like why some like why my family had to like make that decision to come to to San Francisco yeah because I was always asking a lot of questions <laughs> and <laughs> also why I think I also wanted to draw and get into comics is to give um to give her like that space to like marinate on these like ideas and thoughts that could possibly answer the question but it will still kind of be like an ongoing process of self-discovery I hope that makes sense I feel like it's I'm a, been. <laughs> no no it's wonderful it it like it's sort of like you're telling me a story of your journey and I love it I really love it um I wanted to know how do you how do your parents react to your comics <laughs> like they they think it's funny just the way I draw myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I haven't shown them like the memoir stuff like a lot enough because I'm still like writing and until like there comes a time when it gets picked up, I do want to like revisit some moments in my childhood, like just to just to fact check myself or just to hear like their perspective. That's what I'm mm -hmm. hoping to achieve with the memoir too. But um, yeah, my family will also say like, I don't know where you get this drawing stuff from. <laughs> I'm an artist in this family. <laughs> um, that's not true. Like, <laughs> <laughs> There's a story that my mom would tell me about um, like when she was a, um, a kid in Guatemala. I don't know what kind of class she was taking, but it was like some kind of botany like class. Like they had this assignment mm -hmm. where they asked the kids to draw um, a flower or a plant. And at the time, my grandpa was just like very anti like art making like in school, like that's not going to give you any money. That's not going to get you anywhere. So yep. he took my yep. mom's assignment and he drew this like beautifully like elaborate illustration of a flower. I don't know which one it was, but <laughs> my mom kind of cheated on that. <laughs> oh my God. But they would always talk about how my grandpa was really great at drawing. Ah. Mm -hmm. it, what? Wow. That's see that you should put in your memoir because I feel <laughs> I feel that he wanted to like oppress any kind of creative stuff because he wanted people to like self sustain and work. And, you know, mm -hmm. my mom was the same way. Why are you taking art classes? Like, is that going to help you get a job? You <laughs> could pretty much. And mm -hmm. but then he was an artist. 
so like mm-hmm. that would really be interesting to pursue like I would love to read that story because um, just by you telling that little snippet just reminded me of what my mom told me why are you taking art it's not going to help you get a job you know <laughs> <laughs> like like it makes sense in a way absolutely mm-hmm. um so uh, in your comic they call me morena uh for a reason you question your identity as a brown artist questioning if you can claim afro latinx as a part of your identity even through anti-blackness runs deep even though anti-blackness runs really deep in central american history how was your com- how has your comic been accepted in both the Latinx and Afro-Latinx communities? Yeah. I think when, hmm, I feel like for Afro-Latinx and Latinx like communities, um, we are all in the same community since a lot of Latinx culture is very much like um, very black, especially when it comes to music and even food. Mm-hmm. So, like reggaeton itself is just it's it's Spanish <laughs> rap. That's what <laughs> reggaeton is. It's it's Spanish rap. It is, and it, I like both of them. So it's very not only that. It's I think people forget how exactly, and especially in Central America, they forget like, hey, a lot of these places on the coast were mm. docks or where slaves landed like (laughs) look brazil is there's a reason brazil is like that just (laughs) there's a reason brazil is like that and other parts of central america but it's such a thing that for it to be go unsaid like Mm -hmm. we just like we don't talk about that Mm -hmm. and it's kind of thing so it's just like the afro latinx community is the latinx community and the latinx community is that has a problem with acknowledging that Afro Latinx identity, which I think is completely unfair. And uh, it reminds me of a joke someone said about Dominicans <laughs> and how they say that like, oh no, 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 we're not like, we're not black, we're Latinx. And I'm just a, like, bro, you know, you can be both, right? Like you don't have to deny one or the other. Like you're, it's a it's a it's okay to be both (laughs) like you can accept that part of yourself but it's just it's just how it be and maybe I don't have the room to talk because uh I'm not uh I'm not as brown and I I'm pretty sure maybe some down down the list but as I look right now it I have it doesn't look like I'm Afro-Latinx but there's still this history of our communities being intertwined and sometimes it comes out in uh it's gonna it's it's gonna reveal itself one way or another absolutely and Mm -hmm. I actually resonate with like that joke because that was just like the way I saw myself I was like I'm not black like this is not (laughs) everybody always thinking I'm like from Brazil or like Colombia Mm -hmm. Or the DR, like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then another time, somebody um, it was like an Ethiopian gentleman. He thought that I was like straight up from my Ethiopia, <laughs> walking into the Starbucks, and I hear somebody trying to like, like talk to me, and I was like, <laughs> I had like a, I had a like bigger fro like years ago before I started cutting it super short. And he was asking me if I was from Ethiopia. I'm like, oh, brother. Let me... <laughs> <laughs> I understand why you would ask that, but my family is from El Salvador and what in Guatemala. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, um, yeah, I've been curious. Again, little me was also wondering, like, I kind of look like a black person, but then can I even say that? Um, that mm-hmm. looks it too and so does like my other sort of like some of my other relatives on my Salvadoran side um yeah I think it's been a pretty positive experience in general um with the reception of like the comic um they call me Morena for a reason um because 
it's a conversation that needs to happen and part of it is also like me kind of using these comics as sort of a calling card too, <laughs> in case other people are having similar like ruminations with their identity and mm -hmm. I think uh, specifically for Salvadorans um, or Afro Salvadorans and Afro descendientes like it's been so reaffirming just to receive like their their reaction because whenever I get to be in like spaces with other Salvadorans especially those who have been also racialized as black they're like even asking the same questions that I was asking myself in that comic like I don't know like I I want to be careful I want to like like I know what it means to say when you're black like I you you know it's also just like a responsibility and I also don't want to be like appropriating but then that's something that I struggled with for a really long time and I'm really happy that people are feeling more open to not only have these conversations with each other in the Salvadoran community but we also realized oh like we're battling like years and years of colonization mm -hmm. as a community mm -hmm. like they don't want us to say that we're like Afro Salvadorans for a reason too <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's been a part of the Salvador like government and politics for a very long time and now we're just seeing um, Afro Salvadorans in the motherland like fighting the good fight to like demand like representation in like and follow like in similar footsteps like Mexico has taken to like actually acknowledge that they're Afro-Mexicans, there are Black Mexicans in Mexico, and they should be mm -hmm. recognized on the, the Census Bureau. And we're trying to see that in El Salvador, too. And there's a, a really cool org I, I just want to shout out called Afros. Um, it's A-F-A-F-R-O-O-S. Spelling is hard. <laughs> 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 All community run I think they're an NGO as well and they I want to say they also probably organized the very first um, Dia de la Afrodescendencia um, in El Salvador back in 2014 and that was like the first time Afro Salvadoran history and culture was like openly celebrated and mm -hmm. like it was all community run and sometimes I think about damn if it wasn't for the internet like I don't know if I would <laughs> know this stuff yeah. that's mm -hmm. happening like outside of like the U.S. like it's awesome and yeah so it's been it's been a really great experience and I feel like comics has also kind of helped me connect with other Afro Salvadorans um, who just reaffirm like this journey that we're all on and we're not alone in this that is amazing. I just love to hear your stories. They're so amazing. It, and you know, I, um, I mean, you've visited both countries. Um, I've been to Nicaragua and I experienced a lot of colorism. Like they're brown, but they're colorist too. Like it's weird. Like, like yeah. I had some, um, you know, some sneakers, they were dirty and I, and I'm walking around and they're like, why are they so dirty? And I'm like, I like them this way. And they're like, you can't do that. I'm like, those those white tourists are doing it. And they're like, oh, but they're white. They could do that. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, man. They're like, yeah. no, you are like, uh, just the, the treatment. A lot of um, tourists that are white or blonde or they get treated so well when they go to these countries they're like oh they were so friendly and whatever and but when I went and didn't speak because I didn't want them to hear my my accent they treated me so bad they mm. treat each other so bad <laughs> like I, I I it makes me sad that they treat each other that bad you know like they 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 don't see past the color of my skin and that's so weird because the majority is my color <laughs> so <laughs> like hello we look alike <laughs> but anyway I'm sorry I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I'm telling you, I'm like, I just love this conversation. 
it's Love like it. it's yeah. it's a conversation that I think a lot of people need to have especially within this community and just how it is and but like, people shy away from it so much it's just so like oh that's not like it's not appropriate or it's not polite talk or whatever no it's like like no it's no it's necessario kind of thing and it's just so like no I think and, and it's necessario so get the kids to say blah but um I wanted to talk a bit more. I know you brushed up on it about about it a little a little bit, but in half and half, uh, your split comic uh, is specifically about being half Salvi and half Guatemalan. Uh, how would you describe a split comic? And can you explain to us a little bit about how you developed this idea uh, and giving space to your complete ethnic identity? I know we 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 briefly touched upon it, but I I want to get to know a little bit more. Yeah. Um, half and Half was an idea that was inspired by this comic magazine that I picked up at SBX. Um, mm-hmm. Was it 2018 or 2018? I totally don't remember. I am totally blanking on the title of the magazine. And <laughs> I am just like not winning <laughs> in terms of my memory. But um I loved seeing the magazine and um, it was, it was like told to me by like the, um, the person managing the table um, that it was a split magazine. I'm like, oh, like, what is that? Like, mm-hmm. I want to learn more about it. And when they gave me the, the magazine on um, one side, um, it was a cover and you just flip it to the other side of the cover and it's a completely different um, book cover and you you can open it on either side and you start reading through the magazine and then there's like a midway point like basically like in the middle part of like the magazine you have to f- force yourself to flip it and experience like mm-hmm. all these different types of uh, content like one side was just um like very like graphic illustrations and on the other side of the magazine when you flipped it it was just purely um Co- like comics and sequential art so mm-hmm. I wanted to do something like that with half and half and use like a similar approach like the Salvi side is mostly focusing on being Afro Salvadoran and then when you flip it it's mostly like these just single panel comics of experiencing like feelings and sentimental like moments of like embracing my Guatemalan side mm-hmm. yeah and I am so sorry, Jennifer, Jennifer, what was the second part of that question? Um, how, well, it was mostly just about it being a split comic and you explaining uh, about how you wanted to share stuff, which I think you already answered. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, well, I want to just touch upon the last part to give you the opportunity of whether you wanted to add anything or not. The last part of the question was just um, to exp- kind of talk about um, the importance of giving space to your complete ethnic identity, which is exactly mm-hmm. what we've been talking about. But was there anything that you wanted to add to that at all um, before we moved on? Um, let's see. Not so much beyond like how that project was really fun because it was actually something I made that was kind of like a, I used that as a reason to take a break from writing the bigger memoir manuscript. And Mm -hmm. it kind of made me realize, oh wait, I also love doing comic strips and that's (laughs) my origin story or like the genesis slash gateway drug into me wanting to collect comics <laughs> because I I feel like the way I'm able to write now um, I feel a bit more confident as somebody who creates um, comic strips too and it's because I read Garfield the cat comics like uh, religiously yeah. and I didn't even know like all these years I was kind of studying how to like create like humorous content too like in the form of a comic strip <laughs> That's awesome. I used to clip out the Garfield uh, 
comics from the newspaper as a kid and keep them all. That was my that was my favorite comic as a kid growing up. And it's then I and then I graduated to Calvin and Hobbes and as I got older. <laughs> <laughs> Still cat related in a way. <laughs> so Brina, we um as you may or may not know, have a segment on our podcast called Chisme de la Semana. And we like to allow our guests to share their chisme about any upcoming stories or projects that they're working on um, that they would like to share. Yeah, I just finished um, a short comic that's going to be published on Shenandoah Literary Magazine. And Ooh. yeah, I was just like, oh. <laughs> magazine <laughs> oh my god you want me to make something and um I was approached by Rochelle uh, Cruz who's um a comic scholar and just fantastic person all around and the comic that I submitted is called Invitation and it's um I've been wanting to like illustrate myself being in the same room as my younger self because as I'm reworking um the memoir I literally feel like I am sharing the same space with my younger self like from toddler years to middle school into high school like all three of those versions of myself are like here and sometimes they really they really get to my emotions super hard where I'm just like oh, I am like I'm like in my early 30s why does it feel like I am 12 years old and like wanting to cry in my pillow <laughs> <all over again? laughs> so it's about like um feeling feeling my younger self in the room and just remembering what it feels like to um just to kind of like experience repressed emotions like sadness um anger self-deprecating like thoughts as well moments of anxiety and yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really happy how it came out. I, awesome. Yeah, I'm really starting to be into like procreate. I always thought I was going to make everything just purely like in ink. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I still love ink. I'm still going to like do my comics like in ink forever. But yeah, it's good to <laughs> be like, oh, wow, I'm like doing digital art. <laughs> <laughs> and how will we be able to get our hot little hands on um this magazine i believe the the comic will be published on shenandoah literary magazine's website um, oh nice to double check if it comes in print but i want to say it might also come in print but i'm not too sure <laughs> <laughs> nice that's so exciting. I can't wait to see little you. Huh? <laughs> but can I just say that you using the term comic scholar is just like the fact that that even exists, that there are people who are comic scholars are is just amazing. I'm here for it. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Uh, we also have a segment on our podcast called Juntos y Fuertes. Uh, Juntos y Fuertes highlights uh, noteworthy endeavors by members of marginalized groups that we think deserve support. Uh, are there any projects or programs that you'd like to let us know about or plug here on the Las Platicas? Yes. Um, I don't know if y'all met uh, Dustin or AKA Dusty at the Latinx Comic Expo in Modesto. Um, he's illustrating uh, this new uh, graphic novel called Wallo and it's um oh, yeah yes the yeah. Nicaraguense uh immigrate immigration story right immigrant yeah. story yeah I'm so here for it like my husband's from Nicaragua so I'm like I am ready for it I think it just I think it just launched its kickstarter mm -hmm. right yeah, not too long ago I want to say earlier this week yeah yeah so I think it has like about 25 days to go or something but uh it comes in English oh my god look at me taking taking over again <laughs> but, <laughs> like when I get really passionate I just ramble on but yes uh it's it. gonna be in English uh and you can there's a chance to get it in Spanish as well so I'm very very excited and I think they even have some like uh film shorts that that were directed as well but um 
it's about a guy in Nicaragua who immigrated, I think, to El Salvador. Is that correct? Or was it Costa Rica? I think it was El Salvador or Costa Rica. I can't remember. But it's about his journey and his experience as an immigrant trying, trying to seek out, like, work to, you know, mm -hmm. support his family. Um, and it's written by this guy who actually befriended. It's based on a true story, I guess, because he, he befriended Wal Walo. Well, I think his name is something else, but they think they call him Walo for short. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this gentleman, Dustin, is doing the illustration uh, on the comic, uh, the graphic novel. Sorry, I took over. I'm sorry, I'm just, I just started re reading the, the Kickstarter, so I just, I, I know too much now. <laughs> no, no, you did, like, so much justice. <laughs> the description of what I could stir up. Um, I'm always about just, like, giving, like, little, like, brief, like, spark notes like the spark notes version of the spark notes <laughs> <laughs> well, you set it up perfectly for sarah <laughs> yeah and you know there's a lot of discrimination against nicaragüenses in costa rica so like um the, you know they have like a rivalry going on so i don't know if that's the same with the other neighboring uh, countries and maybe they treat them less than because they're immigrated into their country um illegally i think um, so to seek out work so they they pretty much treat him pretty bad so I'm excited to read his journey <laughs> so <laughs> and I'm excited to buy it in Spanish so my my husband and I can have our very own little book club so oh, yeah. I want to join this book club <laughs> <laughs> all right Brina so where can our listeners follow your projects and future projects like what's your website what's your social media please do tell us yeah, my main website um, has most of like my web comics and some of like the stuff that I would normally print on there at brinache.com. It's spelled B R E E N A C H E.com. Um, some people tend to like pronounce it as brinache and. <laughs> <laughs> you fancy. <laughs> Becoming French. <laughs> it's actually a, a nickname my grandpa gave me since I was a kid. Aww. Yeah, it's like stuck with me forever and I love it. Um, <laughs> you can also use Brinache to find me on both Instagram and Twitter. I'm pretty active mostly on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I'm not really great at Twittering yet. I, I think I just got it like two years ago. <laughs> I don't really make funny. If I think about a tweet that I want to say i'm like drafting it and drafting it for like maybe too long which is like 45 minutes and like, <laughs> i'm just gonna draw it out it's just gonna <laughs> it's a different sport. platforms for different folks yeah exactly <laughs> that's funny any other places so instagram twitter and your website yes okay cool what can we find at the pro project you released in January? Oh, yes, for the Baileys. Thank you for reminding <laughs> me that. Yes. Also, Laneja House, um, lanejahouse.com. Should I spell that out? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I needed it. L <laughs> A N E H A House, H O U S E. <laughs> that's awesome well it was such a pleasure to have you here on our on our las platicas podcast for our youtube channel it, it's been great i am starstruck i love you love 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 your work um it's uh, so close to my heart um Again, thank you so much for being on on the show. And I just had such a great time and I learned so much. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, and that brings us to the end of this Las Platicas episode. Uh, we have been your hosts. I'm Sarah. I'm Kristen. I'm Jen. I'm Brina. And don't forget to click subscribe. Uh, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm nervous. laughs> Like and subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.